All right, so I'm going to talk about liver-directed therapies for patients with liver metastases. Some of you are probably already familiar with neuroendocrine tumor of the liver. In general, people with neuroendocrine liver tumors didn't have the tumor start in the liver. In fact, if you look it up, there are fewer than 30 cases in all of history of people who had a primary neuroendocrine carcinoma of the liver. However, up to 40% of people with neuroendocrine tumors that start outside of the liver eventually find that that tumor spreads to the liver. And it depends, the, the rate depends on where it started, whether it was pancreas or small bowel or, or lung or whatever. When neuroendocrine tumor does spread, the liver is the most common site. And frequently, it's the only site. Even if it's not the only site, even f then frequently, it's the most affected site. You might have a little dot somewhere else, but a lot of big dots in the liver. So metastases in the liver are a major source of morbidity, meaning symptoms or disability or pain, as well as mortality or death. And controlling the growth of hepatic metastases can prolong survival and can probably improve most people's quality of life. So what do we mean by liver-directed therapies, and why do we even talk about it? Well, it doesn't always make sense to treat the entire body for cancer when the cancer is actually located in only one spot in the body. By treating that one spot that contains or that one organ that contains the cancer, theoretically we can limit the side effects. Surgery and radiation work this way. For instance, when you go to the surgeon, the surgeon doesn't cut out your whole body. The surgeon cuts out the part that has the cancer. Likewise, radiation therapy shines on the part that has the cancer. There are more options now for directed therapies or spatially directed therapies with the Improve, the constant improvements of imaging technologies and devices. For instance, we can do thermal ablation. There's, there's something called RF ablation, which is like a microwave oven on a stick. And you stick the stick into a tumor, and you cook the tumor. There's image-guided radiotherapy, where real time, uh, we're taking x-rays of your tumor as we're shining the radiation from, from an external beam uh, source of radiation. What I'm going to talk about, though, is what I do for a living. And as George says, and I make a ton of money doing it, so I love doing it, right? Uh, are catheter-based methods. And most of you probably are a little bit familiar with a catheter. A catheter basically is just a medical term for a long, skinny tube. Uh, some of you, unfortunately, are familiar with catheters because they're stuck up into your bladder, which is not so comfortable, let's say, at the time of surgery or something like that. That's not the kind of catheter I'm talking about. I'm talking about even skinnier catheters that I can insert into your blood vessels. And why would I want to do that? It's so that I can do something called embolization or chemoembolization or radioembolization. And why do we do this? Well, again, why treat the whole body if only one particular part of the body has cancer? And not the whole part of that organ, but only parts of it. So here we have a diagram of a liver with these fluorescent green tumors in it. Um, I guess George can tell you whether they actually look that way. I kind of doubt they actually look fluorescent green. It's very easy to kill these tumors if you're allowed to kill the whole organ, all right? But you can't live without a liver. So it doesn't make sense to kill the whole liver in order to kill the cancer. So the question is, how can we kill the tumors that are within the, the liver without killing the liver itself? And from that, we take advantage of some very special physiology and anatomy of the liver. And here, actually, in sort of this pale blue is the liver, and here are these red, uh, bright red things that are tumors. And the liver is one of the only organs in the body that has not one, but has two sources of blood. So for instance, your hand has arteries going to it, has veins coming out of it. So there's basically one system or network of blood vessels going in and one network coming out. The liver, however, even though it only has one network of blood vessels draining blood out of the liver, it has two networks of blood vessels supplying blood into the liver. The normal parts of the liver, which are light blue here in background, receives normally about 70% of its blood from what we call the portal vein and only about 30% from the hepatic artery. The artery, remember, arteries are these high pressure, bright red blood carrying vessels that carry blood basically from the heart. The bright red blood has a lot of oxygen, it has nutrition in it, the portal blood, or the portal vein, is something different. The portal vein carries blood from the spleen and from the intestines to the liver, where the liver usually cleans it up. 
Okay, why does it need cleaning? Well, next time you eat a Big Mac, think about it. Do I want that absorbed Big Mac going straight to my heart and my brain? Probably not, right? I want that stuff cleaned up by my liver first before it's distributed throughout the body. And that's the, the purpose of the portal system of the liver. However, tumors do not like portal blood. Maybe they don't like Big Macs or something. Um, but any tumor that's larger than about three millimeters in diameter, which is about one-tenth of an inch, receive at least 90% of their blood supply from the hepatic artery. They like that bright red, high pressure, high oxygen blood. They don't like that dissolved Big Mac. So to put this into uh, a more real, real life perspective, are any of you graduates from Cal, Berkeley, or other Cal? Okay, good. And, and of course, some of you, and many of you are familiar with Stanford. Even those, those of you that didn't go to either of those schools know that Cal and Stanford have had a very, very long tradition of a sports rivalry. And this has actually occurred before I arrived at Stanford, but this was the big game in 1982. Remember where you know Stanford was ahead in the last play of the game, the Cal guys rattled the ball like nine times, ran over a, a you know a, a trombonist in the in the band, and scored a touchdown and won. Well, my friends that were at Stanford at the time are still bitter about this, <laughs> and so they're still. <laughs> So they're still thinking, oh, man, how can we get back at those, those cow guys? Well, think of the stadium as your liver, and think of the cow fans as tumors. <laughs> so if you, wanna, if you really want to get back at the cow fans, how, how can you do that? Well, one way is uh, some, some of the ways that, for instance, the target therapies that Dr. Kunz was talking about, where you go through the stadium and you one by one interrogate each each fan and say, are you for Cal or are you for Stanford? And if you're for Cal, then you, you do something nasty to them. If they're for Stanford, you do something nice to them. But even when you do that, though, even the Stanford fans will still get a little bit uptight. They'll, they'll feel harassed a bit. And that's why there are some side effects of, of medications and treatments that treat the entire body, including the tumors and non-tumors. So I got a better idea. So at, at the Stanford entrance to the... Uh, to the football stadium. We'll set up a nice little food cart here, and we'll give, give the Stanford people some nice food on the way in. And at the Cal entrance, we'll set up another catering cart, but uh, we'll poison their food. <laughs> and that way, you don't have to go inside the stadium and look at each seat and ask them, hey, are you for Cal or are you for Stanford? You can get them on the way in, all right? Well, the same sort of idea can apply to the liver, because remember, the liver has two entrances. It has the portal vein, and it has the hepatic artery. So in order to give stuff to the tumor, give the cancer-killing stuff into the artery, because it will preferentially go to the tumors. What can we give? Well, we can give chemotherapy, which we, call, we would call chemoinfusion. We can combine that with particles or stuff that blocks the flow of blood. We call that chemoembolization. We can block the flow of blood and put in radioactive stuff. That's called radioembolization. Or we can also do something called bland embolization, which is just blocking the blood. So I'm going to go over some of these options. First, I'm going to go through the two that are less popular. So there's one called hepatic arterial chemoinfusion. This can be done through a temporary catheter that's inserted through the groin into the liver, and we inject chemotherapy directly into the liver. It can also be done through a permanently implanted port or through a surgically implanted pump that has a reservoir that you can fill with chemo, and it constantly pumps a little bit of chemo into the liver uh, at all times. Uh, we, we can deliver a very high concentration and a, a high amount of chemo to the liver, more so than to the rest of the body, because the liver is what sees the, the, the chemo first before it gets diluted. However, it's been very difficult to prove that there's really any benefit of this type of administration of chemotherapy versus intravenous administration of chemotherapy. So in general, this is not a very popular treatment. Uh, similarly, there's something called bland embolization, bland meaning that there's no chemo in it. By bland embolization, embolization is a fancy medical word basically meaning stopping the flow of blood or, or plugging up the, the blood vessels so that there's no longer flow of blood. We do this by injecting mechanical blockers of arterial blood flow. It's kind of like ingest, injecting medical-grade dust or medical-grade sand 
that flows downstream and lodges in the smaller and smaller blood vessels and blocks these blood vessels from carrying blood. By doing that, we can starve tumors of blood and nutrition and oxygen. Bland embolization does work, but we're not really sure how well it works. And most people think, well, if you're going to stop the flow of blood, why don't you stop the flow of blood after you've injected something else in it that can also help to kill the tumor? So there are uh, there are trials looking at bland embolization comparing to other treatments like chemo and radioembolization, but in general, most physicians feel that, well, if you're going to be there anyway, you might as well throw the kitchen sink at the tumor instead of pulling your punch and just giving bland embolization. So these, these trials have been going on for years and probably and may never be finished because uh, not only physicians but patients don't want to be randomized to something that might be less than uh, the most aggressive therapy available. So I'm going to talk about the two things that we do most commonly. The first is called transarterial chemoembolization. Sometimes it's abbreviated as TACE. The technique involves injection of a concentrated chemotherapy mixed with a sticky oil and the embolization material. Remember, the embolization material is like the medical-grade sand or dust that floats downstream and lodges in the blood vessels. There's another technology that's been developed in the past few years that we're also looking at where we it's called drug-eluting beads. Now, these beads are microscopic. They're, they're barely larger than the size of a blood uh, corpuscle or a blood cell. But these beads are made out of basically a spongy plastic material. And just like a regular sponge, they can absorb fluid. And in this case, they can absorb chemo. And so this is another way that we're looking at doing chemoembolization. We can inject tiny sponges that are soaked with chemo, uh, chemotherapies. The rationale for chemoembolization is that we can deliver a very high dose of chemotherapy locally, right in the tumors within the liver. We can also trap the chemo there so that there's a prolonged dwell time, so we can really pickle these, these uh, tumor cells. Combined with this, we block the flow of blood. So there's something called ischemia, which is basically lack of blood, lack of oxygen, and lack of nutrients, all of which are necessary for tumor growth. And by trapping everything in the liver and in the tumors, again, we can limit the amount of toxicity or side effects systemically as well as to the other parts of the liver. Uh, this is one of the few things in my field, actually, where there is a little bit of trial evidence saying that it do does work. So in, in 2002, there were two trials published, one from Spain and one from Hong Kong, uh, looking at hepatocellular carcinoma, or primary liver that starts in uh, liver cancer that starts in the liver. This is not cancer uh, that starts somewhere else and spreads to the liver. This is not neuroendocrine cancer, but this is a more common type of liver cancer. And both of these studies showed that the hazard ratio was about a half. And for those of you who are not real familiar with statistics, like myself, the way that I think about this is that if you're treated with chemoembolization and you have HCC, your chance of dying within a certain period of time is approximately cut in half. That's, that's not bad. It's not a cure, but it definitely buys you time. This is something that I'm sure you are all very used to hearing. There are no data for neuroendocrine carcinoma, all right? So we have to sort of extrapolate, saying, well, you know, if it works for HCC, then yeah, it probably works for neuroendocrine carcinoma as well. And uh, chemoembolization is something that's been around since the 1960s. And so we, there have probably been hundreds or even thousands of patients treated with metastatic neuroendocrine carcinoma, but I can't really give you numbers for exactly how well it works because everyone just sort of does it off-label, uh, not in the context of a trial. Here is one example of a patient that we treated uh, many years ago with metastatic neuroendocrine carcinoma. Here we see a very large and then a relatively small tumor. After chemoembolization, four months later, this is what the CT scan looked like. You can see that both of the tumors actually got smaller. Each of these tumors, instead of being sort of this mottled uh, black and gray and white, is now almost completely bright white. That bright white stuff is the stuff that we injected. That's the, the oil uh, that carries the chemotherapy into the tumor, and it, sti it sticks there essentially permanently. All right, let's move on to the last one, and this one is something that has been a little more newsworthy in the, in the last few years, called radioembolization. Radio standing for radioactive embolization, again, apply, uh, applying the, uh, injecting the sand or the dust to, to stop the flow of blood. When we do radioembolization, we use an isotope called yttrium-90, which is a pure beta emitter. Beta particles are actually electrons, and as radiation goes, electrons are pretty heavy which means they can't penetrate very far. 
which is good because I want to inject this in the liver and I want it to treat the liver. I don't want it to irradiate your brain or your toes, right? And so these beta particles have an average tissue penetration of only 2.5 millimeters, again, about one-tenth of an inch, with a maximum penetration of 11 millimeters, which is less than half an inch, which means I deposit it where I want it, and it only applies the radiation right there. It doesn't go to the other parts of the body. It's made by neutron bombardment of yttrium-89, decays to zirconium-90. For those of you that remember 11th grade chemistry, here it is, number 39 on the periodic chart. And one of these, these uh, things that you never had to know about, you never learned about. It was always ignored because you only looked at the stuff on this end and on that end. Uh, anything that's radioactive has something called a half-life. A half-life uh, means that in this half-life of yttrium-90 uh, is 64 hours. That means every 64 hours, it becomes only half as radioactive as it was before. So which means after about three weeks or so, the amount of radioactivity that you're given in radioembolization is essentially uh, undetectable back down to background levels. So what's the rationale for radioembolization? Pretty much the same or very similar as that to chemoembolization. However, the liver itself is also sensitive to radiation. So you can't just willy-nilly bombard the, the liver with radiation. That's why, in general, radiation therapy from external beam is not usually used on the liver. Once you get to about 30 or 40 grays of radiation dose, the liver goes into failure. Uh, and there's something called VOD, which is veno-occlusive disease, or RILD, which is radiation-induced liver disease. And again, if your liver fails, you can't live without your liver. So we have to keep the radiation dose under 30. Tumors may be radio-resistant, but basically anything above about 80 gray can be killed. So when we give radioactive particles into the bloodstream, into the uh, hepatic artery, they preferentially lodge in the tumors and give extra radiation to the tumors without giving much radiation to the background liver. There are two uh, commercially available products, Surspheres from Australia and Therospheres from Canada. These are about $15,000 a dose. All right. Here's one patient with metastatic neuroendocrine treat, uh, treated by radioembolization. This is an MRI. This is called a T2-weighted image, and this is called a, a contrast-enhanced T1-weighted image. Basically, everything that's white here is tumor. Three months after treatment, the tumors are still there, but they're a lot smaller. And you can also see that the inside of these tumors are black because they've been starved of nutrition, they've been starved of oxygen, they're actually probably dead. But again, somewhere in here, there are still live tumors probably. All right, so how do we choose between the two? Unfortunately, there are no direct comparisons available. The side effects are very similar. Basically, people feel very tired for at least a week, usually two or three weeks, sometimes lack of appetite, sometimes some pain. The uh, evidence for effectiveness is also very similar. They each kill a majority of the tumor cells and a majority of patients, but it's very difficult to predict who's actually going to benefit. Radioembolization is more expensive, but it's designed to be a one-time only treatment. But the nice thing is that they're not mutually exclusive. So if we do one and either it doesn't work or it works for a short period of time and stops working, we can switch over and do the other. So I always give the patients, hey, which one do you want to try first? And for some reason, over 90% of patients actually try radioembolization first. Go figure. I think there's some stigma about the word chemo. So in conclusion, <laughs> cancer, especially neuroendocrine carcinoma, is not an automatic death sentence even after it spreads to the liver, and it can be treated as a chronic disease. Although many cancers, including neuroendocrine, are spread systemically, liver tumors are responsible for significant morbidity and mortality. Spatially targeted methods, again, I'm not talking about chemically targeted methods like the way that Dr. Kunz was talking about, but spatially targeted methods injecting directly into the liver using chemoembolization or radioembolization, though not curative, result in substantial benefit. The last thing to consider is that all of these things are not approved by the FDA for neuroendocrine carcinoma. Like, big surprise, right? What is approved for neuroendocrine car carcinoma? But what that means is, if you elect to try doing this, you may have to fight with your insurance company to get them to pay for it. Thank you.